Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host, and we have an interesting show for you this evening. We have Patrick Jackson and Stephen Colburn, and they have basically Patrick's come up with a theory on what he thinks uh, things are related, all related. And when it comes to some of the paranormal, uh, some people will argue that UFOs are not paranormal because there's so much evidence that they're here that they're not exactly paranormal. But anyway, uh, that's minor compared to uh, I'm interested in just hearing what his thoughts are on what we may be seeing. Now, he does a lot of work with orbs, which may be different than your average UFO. I'm not sure. We're going to be talking about all that in just a minute. This week, we have Charles Lear back with our blog. And this week, and it's called When UFOs Were Left to Private Investigators. And there's a number of people, including... Uh, uh, Donald Kehoe, who you don't think of, I guess he did some investigating um, after his years uh, with the service in the military. Uh, but anyway, it's a great blog as usual, so check that out. And uh, next week we have uh, my friend Lee Spiegel will be on, and we are good to go. I'm going to bring in our guest, starting with uh, Patrick Jackson. Welcome to the show, Patrick. Hi, how are you doing? All right. Doing well, thank you, and glad to see you here. And we're a little, he's having a little trouble with this camera, but at least he's here. <laughs> Stephen, how are you? Uh, Stephen, you're in Oxnard, California, and Patrick, you're yeah, in right. the UK. Yes. And so, Patrick, where where are you in the, what part of the UK um, do you live? Where do you live? I'm in uh, West London. West London. Oh, okay. And I've heard a lot, I'll, now I brought this up recently. I think it was with Philip Mantle. I said, uh, that some people tell me that a lot of there's not a lot of sightings in a lot of the UK because of the weather. Is that is that something you ever hear about, or does it not matter? They're they're everywhere. Um, it's probably because it's so cloudy. Cloudy most well. of the time, yeah. So it's it's probably happening above the clouds. Um, but uh, I think that just it's just as common here as it is anywhere else. Yeah, it's just we don't see it as much because of the weather. Yeah, because it's more dark and grey. Uh, in our, in, you know, generally, uh, but right. right now we've got a really good summer, so you, you know people will start seeing more about this time of year. And as and Steve, and where you're at um, is the number one place in the country where not not just because of the population, but uh, because of there's a lot of really great weather out in California. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's partly because of the weather, and partly because Southern California here is a major UFO hotspot as well. Um, um, the UK is probably just as hot. They just don't see them as much because of the clouds, like Patrick was saying. And Arizona is actually a big hot spot too, just across the uh, uh, California eastern border there, hmm. and the right. Mojave Desert in general. Right. Uh huh. So, Patrick, let's let's start on. Uh, well, first of all, the name of your book. Uh, put it out there if you would. Uh, the name is Quantum Paranormal: A Twenty First Century Analysis of the Paranormal Phenomena. And what made you, well, first of all, were you interested in so-called paranormal before you, for a long time, and, and then you kind of put your study mm -hmm. in that together? Is that how that happened? Yeah, so I kind of grew up in a, a very paranormal, paranormal hotspot with um, ghosts and UFOs, kind of like being seen quite a lot. And uh, I don't actually mean by big flying saucers flying over the place. I mean, uh, I used to see these little balls of light flying over the, uh, the streetlights. A lot and I never knew what they were so I just used to watch them and now be that um, but uh, the paranormal is all well basically backing up a bit is one day uh, I was sitting there on the field and I looked across and uh, I saw a guy dressed as a monk in the middle of the field and I wondered what it was I was like you know I, I just thought it was some crazy guy uh, standing in the middle of the field and um, so I started shouting abuse at him for a while and then uh, that, he didn't have any sort of reaction, so I, I pulled out my laser pointer and I put a laser right on his face or, or where his face would be. Um, and what it was, was it was like this, uh, it looked like a monk with his hood up and a completely black face. So I put the laser right on his face and um, it, it kind of reflected, and, but you couldn't see anything. It was just like a big black mass. Uh, and that kind of, you know, interests me a bit. So I just got up and started walking towards it because I actually just thought it was someone had dumped a like a statue in the middle of the field. Uh, and I got within about 15 feet of it, something like that, and it just disappeared in front of me. 
and I'd never seen anything like that before. So I kind of like that's kind of like woke me up a bit. And I was thinking, oh, that's that's interesting. You know. And then I, I basically um, I said uh, to the, the local villagers um, in the like the local pub, and I said to them um, like a week later, I, I just said, I think I saw like a look like a monk across the field or something, you know. And they go, oh yeah, that's the mad monk. He haunts here. And I was like, <laughs> what's that? You know. <laughs> so I never had that before. And um, and that what kind of got me into it. I, I was like, well, you know, normal, normally um, people dismiss uh, ghosts and stuff, but when you actually see it for a long period of time with your own eyes, and also you shine lasers on it and, and stuff like that, that's when it kind of gets interesting, and that's what uh, that what got me into it. And so basically, and fa yeah. So fast forward a bit longer is is uh, my background is um, well to. So after that, I basically started watching all the paranormal TV shows, uh, everything from the US and here in the UK for, for years. And uh, but nothing really gelled with me. Um, it all just didn't make sense to me. You know, um, they say like a spirit came back from the dead or a guy from 400 years ago is haunting the place or something like that. And none of, none of it really gelled with me. None of it made any sense. Uh, and it kept on bugging me for a long time. Um, so eventually, uh, I think it was in 2014, 2015, I decided to really make a go of it and see if I could figure it out. Um, so basically, my, my day job is um, I'm, a, I'm a database guy. I work in um, processes and reverse engineering. Um, so how that generally works is, is a developer will turn up for the company, develop a load of good stuff, and then he will leave. And no one knows how it works. So someone like me would have to come along and figure it all out and document it so the company can then replicate it or modify it or, or do whatever. And this is this is nothing special in IT. This is what a lot of people do. The only difference is, is that I use the same kind of um, the same um, thought process uh, on the paranormal. And that's what I that's what I did. Um, so I I basically rented out a place called 30 East Drive, uh, which is uh, said to be the most violent portuguese in the UK. Um, because I wanted to figure out what portuguese were to, to start, you know. And um, so I did, and I stayed there for quite a while. And uh, I I was in there, and, and I had some ideas, but none of it really made sense. And after a few couple of couple of days of being in there, all my theories were completely trashed. So I was like, I had to start from, from scratch again. But what I, I had the whole thing filmed, and I noticed that uh, I, finally got, I finally got hold of this image, and when I looked at it, uh, and I put it through some imaging software. It came out as a small silver ball. And I was like, that looks familiar. And I realized that that's the same thing as I used to see growing up, uh, flying over my village. And then once I saw this small silver sphere in the, in the building, I looked at its behavior patterns. And then I realized that the behavior patterns in, in, the, in these haunted houses aren't human at all, that they're actually process driven. It's computer like. So the same thing keeps happening each time. The same door will keep banging. You'll see the same processes uh, replicating around around the world. And when I when I saw that, it was like, okay, so what's going on there, you know? And then I realized after a little bit of study that it's the same technology that the pilots saw during World War II, which was the Foo Fighters. And then I realized after a bit more digging that there's three variants of the Foo Fighters. There's type one, two, and three, which how I describe it. So the type ones operate at 100,000 feet. That's seen from the ISS. That's seen from the by the U.S. Navy currently. Um, they're seen um, by commercial airliners. They're seen all over the place, uh, and they operate in swarms and clusters. And what they do is they intercept external groups and interests. So they intercept um, other UFOs. Other, other flying saucers, other, other craft. And how they do this is through a, a, a very particular type of mechanism. So what happens is, is, is that there's three types. You have type one, two, and three. The, the type one's obviously up there. The type two is the smaller. They're about the size of, of, a, um, of a football, or, or yeah, about a football, uh, like the bet sphere was. That's, that was a type two. And what they do is they, uh, they operate in areas such as woodlands or uh, areas of harsh environments, so up, up mountains, uh, woodlands, jungle, uh, middle of the ocean kind of thing. And then you have the type threes, which are the smaller variants. And they're about the size of a, of a baseball. And they operate in buildings. 
and they are the uh, root cause of poltergeist activity. So how it works is, is when the type ones are up, up in the atmosphere and they detect something in the atmosphere, they can't signal each other because if they do, the one in the middle will detect them. So what they do is they do a signal redirect down to the ground. And so what they do is that they signal down the type uh, threes in buildings, the type three will come online. And then what will happen is it will start uh, emitting gamma rays and microwaves. And that's why people start feeling sick and they start fainting in haunted houses. They get headaches and they feel nauseous because it's, it's low level radiation poisoning. They use a thing called burst relaying um, protocol. So if you, if, you, um, if you look at all the haunted houses in the UK and map them, you'll notice that they operate in lines and clusters, which means that it mimics or very similar to our own microwave-based communication networks. So what they do is they signal down and signal back up again. And then what happens is once that data link is established, they can then triangulate on the objects, surround it, and intercept it before being detected. And then once the whole process is up and done, it will then shut down. So but while this, this transmission is occurring, because of the high energy emissions, it will cause diversions to move people away. So it will bang the door downstairs. Like in 30 East Drive, the uh, type three is operating in the attic. And what it does, it bangs the coal shed door downstairs. So everybody in the house rushes down to the coal shed door. But if you actually look at the map of the house, it's actually the most shielded part of the house. So if you're emitting gamma rays and, and microwaves, it's the most safest part of the building to be in because the walls would absorb all the, all the emissions. So what they try to do is, is that they move people away from high energy emissions. And this behavior is replicated time and time again in all these haunted houses and all the haunt, all these uh, poltergeist uh, footage is where people have been dragged away or been held in positions. Um, and it's because it's the, they're trying to keep people out of the way of high energy emissions. It's that simple. And so this is why poltergeist activity is so intermittent because it's a transponder. It comes online, does its thing, and then shuts down. So something will happen on a Monday and then nothing for a week, and then it'll happen again. It doesn't matter what you do or what you say or how much you coax it, nothing will happen until it comes online again. And that's what's happened. And this has actually been proven recently um, by one of um, Brandon's uh, Brandon's guys, a guy called Jim, he put a load of gamma ray and uh, and microwave detectors in basically what well, haunted buildings, and guess what he detected? Gamma ray and microwave bursts. Are you talking about Skinwalker? Uh, he's one of his one of his guys. I think it's something to do with the basins, uh, one of one of those buildings. But he put a load of sensors in in a, in a group of buildings, mm -hmm. uh, and he he was picking up gamma ray and microwave bursts which is exactly how I modeled it. Now, when you were talking about the triangulation and the orbs and all that, you seem pretty confident that you, that this is what is happening. How do you, how do you know this is what's really happening? Because there's video of it. There's, um, there's images from it, from the Pentagon. There's images from, from the 1950s. Uh, all you have to do is get the image and boost it up a little bit with contrast. And lower down the the um, the brightness, and you can see them, and it's the same process every time. So uh, you had some of these things on your Facebook page. Is that is that is that what you're That's talking right. about? That's mm right. -hmm. And I can actually share that. Um, uh, but before I do that, I should ask our other guest, uh, Steve. <laughs> Uh, basically, what what got you interested in this topic to begin with, and how did you connect with Patrick? Well, I've always been interested in the topic, and um, um, I got into uh, being a UFO, um, an abduction researcher in a major way about um, um, around uh, 2008 when um, I'm an experiencer myself, and uh, the aliens put a... a, a an implant in my uh, left second toe. And I went to um, talk to Dr. Lear about it. And uh, we ended up uh, becoming partners and he took the object out and um, I analyzed it with some uh, in state of the art instrumentation I had at my work at that time. And um, so I've been a, a, a researcher of this subject ever since.
and um, um, I um, heard about Patrick's work and thought it was very interesting, and uh, he uh, asked me to work with him on it. And okay, Steve, actually, I... sorry, yeah. and Steve actually, um, he uh, did a material analysis on one of the spheres that crashed a few years ago. Yeah, I've uh, yeah, I've 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 got uh, analysis of several uh, implants that Dr. Lear removed from his patients, including my own, and um, uh, I have a piece of um, a sphere that uh, Patrick is calling a Type One mm -hmm. that crashed in Mexico back around um, around uh, 2000 that uh, Hami Masan got a hold of, and um, it, it turned out to be a very interesting uh, piece of technology. It's a it's an, a titanium alloy, but it's got um, uh, nanomaterials embedded in the metal, including uh, carbon nanotubes. And um, it also had voids deliberately introduced into the metal to lower the density. And it's incredibly strong stuff. Um, it was very hard to cut. And the only reason I was able to cut a piece off, I think, is because um, parts of it were damaged by heat from the crash. Um, it apparently had an electromagnetic field around it that was really strong, and it collapsed when the, when the uh, object crashed. And um, most of the heat was dumped into the poles of the sphere and vaporized some of the metal and the um, the area around the areas that were vaporized were damaged by heat and lowered the strength a bit. So I was able to get a piece off for analysis. And um, uh, uh, Masson said that um, the um, rancher that um, that witnessed the crash that it killed a cow, the blast killed a cow 100 meters away. So there's an incredible amount of energy in these things when they're um, charged up and uh, flying. Um, is any um, of those the images of what you're talking about in on the Facebook page available to to see? Yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, I, I can. I have, I have the uh, the report on the um, the object, and uh, you're welcome to have a copy. Yeah, that's on the Facebook page as well. And as far as uh, you know, you 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 talk about this crashed piece and all that, and also your. Uh, the topic has come up come up on this show before with what happened to Roger Lear's, you know, uh, implants that he removed, supposedly removed, and where are they now? Are and what type of testing has been done on them? You're familiar with all that? Uh, yeah, I've uh, I've analyzed um, I've analyzed uh, about five of the objects. And and what 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 do you know about them? They're sophisticated pieces of nanotechnology. Uh, they're they're a lot like the um, like the sphere um, uh, sample. They have uh, they're they're metal with um, with nanotechnology built into the metal, and um, uh, they uh, they give off radio frequencies and they they're self powering. Apparently, they connect to the nervous system. They have they have um, uh, apparently enzymes in the uh, or enzymes or some chemical cue in the um, surface of the metal that allows. Uh, or causes uh, uh, proprioceptor nerves to grow into the objects, and they develop a very tough um, uh, outer membrane um, that um, apparently acts as the uh, the interface between the uh, electronics in the device and the uh, nervous system. And um, they're, uh, in my opinion, way beyond our our uh, civilian technology right now. Huh. Okay. And they're also made of meteoric uh, iron or or. or all the ones I've uh, analyzed have a certain percentage of meteoric iron. Some are pure meteoric iron. Some are a percentage. And so um, they're yeah. from off planet, apparently. Well, yeah. I mean, I've I've heard of these things, but I've never really seen, um, you know, any reports on them or anything like that. So, is there anything here we can take a look at that, uh, in particular, either one of you can answer? Uh, I don't know if there's. I'm just scrolling yeah. through all these images. So if you stop there and, and see the one uh, second from the left. Second from the left. Hang on. Let me see if I can. Um, are you talking about this one right here with a bunch I of think, images? Yeah. So that's the one in uh, 30 East Drive. That's a Type 3. It's about the size of a, um, of a, of a baseball. Uh, and there's a lower picture there, and that's the same thing in a field, which also create crop circles. Oh, yes. Uh, that's one I've seen. That's the one on the uh, next to it on the right. This one is that something one. to do with um, the one that went into the water off of the Omaha, something like that. Yeah, it's the same objects you just saw. Um, it's a Type Three, so it's hovering next next to the uh, the ship. Okay, and let's see. Uh, so I'm just scrolling through these and taking a look. 
And it looks like, well, there's a lot of images, but you, I too did see a couple of things of that I recognize. I just, uh, I just saw the sphere that I got a, a sample of uh, down below. Okay, tell me where, where I go. Keep going. Yeah. Keep and, going. And um, I will have this in the show notes for those of you that are listening to this in audio. Yeah, keep going. Keep going. Okay. Uh, Thanks for keep your going. It's, uh, you're almost there, I think. There it is. There, there, there it is. The gray metal sphere. This metal sphere right here. Yes. That's the one I have a sample of. And, and where um, was that? Where was that found? That was found uh, about uh, 100 miles south of the U.S. border. Um, uh, closest U.S. town was Brownsville, Texas, on the um, east coast of Mexico. Okay. And so if you if you go up, you'll see the material analysis of that. If you go keep going up and go right. to, the, to the features tab, all the and, way up. And, uh, but I'm wondering why you have this Da Vinci painting here. So the spheres, um, if you look at them, uh, say the second image from the left, on the you see the spheres with up, 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 up. This one right here. Yeah. Can I control the mouse at all? <clears throat> this one here. Right. You're talking about? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, can I control the mouse? Oh, no, unfortunately not. Okay, so uh, if you uh, go, if you if you go up, up a bit. Yep. See the one on the left next to no down a bit. You see the one uh, where you see the flying saucer, top left. Okay. Oh, this one you're talking about right here. That one, yeah. So what you see is a is a three sphere surrounding it like this, and yeah. this is a triangle. This is a triangulation process. So what happens is, is that in this in this um, configuration, the craft has nowhere to go because it can't get away. In this once once it's in this formation, this can't escape weapons lock. So basically, these will surround it and then uh, fire all at once, and the craft will be at atomized. And then now, if you uh, uh, close this one. Some okay. some UFOs, uh, presumably belonging to a different species, actually launch these uh, these orbs too. Yeah, and also Honey Masana's film of um, hundreds of these Type One uh, orbs uh, docking with uh, snake-like um, uh, bases or whatever you want to call it uh, at about a hundred thousand feet altitude, so high up you can't see them from the ground. Yeah, stop there. Go, to, go back down. Go back down. Go okay. back down. Okay, I'm just I'm just looking real quickly here. Okay. And uh, I will because uh, these right here, I wanted to know uh, what what's the, what's the story. Um, well, if, if there's a better picture than that, but in a nutshell, um, I'll show you. Close that. This one here, you see the one next to it on the right. That's it. So the top one here is the one in thirty East Drive. It's a, the Type Three, which um, about the size of a baseball. This one here is a Bet Sphere. The one below, the one below that is the one Steve. Um, Tested, and this one here setting out set outside the Vatican. So it yeah. appears that it appears that uh, I mean this is a um, sculpture, and it yeah. appears to be the same thing as as the spheres that we are we are testing on. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, these are these all here are in, uh, Italian sculpt sculptures. That's right. Yeah. Okay. yeah. The one I analyze is titanium alloy with uh, a lot of nanotechnology in it, the bet sphere, or some other uh, very high density material. Yeah. Okay, and and I just I did ask uh, what wh why do you have this particular painting? Um, so if you look in if you look in the uh, the series holding in his hand, right, you'll see there's three lights. Uh, yeah, that that's a reflection. And by the way, this this painting was eighty three percent restored. So everything you see in this painting, eighty over eighty percent of it is new paint. Um, yeah, I know who the restorer was and everything. But if you look at the uh, next image along. It matched the, that configuration of the lights. That the that one there, this one the, here, the one down there. Yep, that's the intercept process. That's what they look like when they're intercepting other targets, which looks exactly the same as what's in the uh, what's in the ball. I see the reflection on the ball, but that yeah, well, okay, similar. Yeah. All right. So anyway, we can get back to. Uh, I see you have a lot of things that look pretty familiar. Um, through here uh different ones that i've seen but what is in particular what is this right here that's another one another sample that we're testing uh we can't talk too much about that one there's there's a lot of stuff going on with that in the background 
Uh, but that's uh, that's actually one of the syntax, uh, and it's still semi-active. So you're saying that this? Well, let's get back to um, Steve. What you said that you took a piece of, and right. how how did you take? How did you actually remove a piece from this, and why didn't you just take the whole thing? Well, it belongs to Jaime Masson. He didn't want to. He didn't want to uh, part with the whole thing, but he he, he consented to to uh, give me a piece for analysis and. Um, uh, a colleague and I cut uh, a piece off of it with a um, Dremel motor tool with a silicon carbide disc. And um, I don't think that even would have scratched it if um, uh, it hadn't been damaged by heat, though. The edges of the metal around there were where I took the sample, and those are definitely damaged by heat. Um, the rest of the metal, I'd estimate, was at least uh, three or four times stronger than that area. Um, it was so strong that uh, carbide would barely scratch it. And um, we actually had another an implant uh, from patient 16 in uh, uh, Dr. Lear's uh, project that um, was made of a material that um, was a, an iron alloy reinforced the carbon nanotubes that was so strong that even diamond tools wouldn't cut it. We had to use a high energy laser to cut it in half for analysis. Oh, that's interesting. So, um, so once you take, it just seems to me like a couple of different things. Um, and I want to ask you, uh, maybe I'll start with you, Patrick, on this. Um, so the the sphere that I brought up just, whoops, I don't know, that came went up by accident. The sphere that came up uh, that you said you can't talk about, I just had it up. And what is the particular reason why you can't talk about that? Right now you say you're doing some work on it. Is there, yeah. uh, what can you tell us about it? Um, it's the real thing, and it's semi-active. And semi-active, what does that mean? It, it rolls around all day on its own. It's basically the best sphere 2.0. And so do you have, like, if this thing is rolling around, where is it kept? Is it kept by um, someone that doesn't want to show it to other people? or or Something like that, yeah. yeah. As I say, there's there's a lot of stuff going on in the background with it. Uh, but that, that's going to be coming out in the next few months. Okay. So if this thing really was some alien type technology, it kind of would put a lot of things to bed, wouldn't it? You know, as far as the debate of uh, things coming here or not and, and all that. I mean, this seems like it could be something really yeah. major if this was the case and yeah. change everything if this was the case. And so... I guess a couple of questions I have for you is um, it's not in government hands, right? No. And is there, is this person working exclusively with anyone that can get the word out there if the thing really ends up being something spectacular? Yeah, they're working with me. So it's, I have the exclusive access to it. And how would you like if, all right, let's just say, Let's just run a scenario. Let's say this thing did incredible things. It would, uh, it was uh, intelligent uh, and could maneuver on its own or whatever. And uh, you actually have it captured and wherever it is, and it's not going to get away. <laughs> uh, how would you get the word out? Who would you get the word out to if this is the case? If this thing somehow seemed to be off planet? an off-planet type of thing, how would you get the word out there to the world? Uh, the media. There's, there's a lot. There's uh, quite a few media who are interested in this already. And how long has this thing been known about in, and what country is it in? It's been known about for a little while, uh, but I can't say where it is. Uh -huh. But as I say, you'll find out soon because it's, it's just uh, it's, it's in progress. So you'll find out soon. All right. And... Um, can you tell me what type of a scient is there? Would there be access, like for instance, if we talked off air and I said, hey, look, I've got this great scientist guy that works with metal and and metallurgy and, and all that. And uh, because I actually do have uh, access to some, some people like this that would be very interested. Is this something that could be observed by someone in the science field? Yes, and that's been arranged. And it, it could be arranged? No, it is being arranged. It is being arranged. Mm. Uh-huh. Okay. 
Um, all right. Well, I I'd, I'd be interested to to know more about that as yeah. As, yeah. as time. Of course, you know, anytime you say you can't talk about something, that's all the email you're going to get. And myself is okay. We everyone wants to know why you can't talk about it and what is it. Well, that's so, the way it works. Yeah, I'm afraid that's the way it works. Is if you want something properly tested, it has to be done quietly. Um, it can't be done really in the media. Now, have you physically seen this yourself, or have you seen it? Yes. Through? You have physically seen this. Yeah. And in fact, I've seen quite a few spheres in, throughout my research, um, in buildings, um, personally, and outside. Um, so I've seen quite a few. There are several crash spheres that uh, are uh, in private hands right now that um, might be bought for the right price as well. Here. Yeah. Well, hey, look, if something was could be proven that it was off planet, um, their price could be whatever someone puts on it. You know that because that would change everything. So uh, I, I guess I would like to say to you, if that's so, is that something you know the whereabouts and all that? Yeah, I know where it is. Yeah, um, is it for sale? No. Yeah. Hmm. But I'm I'm talking to you, Stephen. You say you know where these things are. You know where some things are, or you just uh, I I I used to know where a couple of them were. I could find out again. I'm, I'm if, they're, if they're still available. But um, they apparently uh, uh, fall out of the sky um, on a fairly regular basis, and and um, I have reason to believe that at least two or three are in private hands, besides the one that Patrick is talking about. Hmm. Okay. Here's a question here. Uh, Mary Grace wants to know, do these, does the active sphere make any sound? Uh, no, but it does vibrate a lot. Mm. It vibrates. And, mm. and uh, all right. So I saw when I showed the picture of it, I showed it being on a stand. Mm. And uh, let me see if I can bring that back up. Uh, uh, I saw it being on a stand when you when the thing is put on the on the ground. This isn't the thing anyway here, but when it's put on the ground, does it supposedly do anything? That yeah, one does not. That that one's that one's not active anymore. It, no, it, it, I'm sorry. It, uh... I, I meant to put up the other one. Um, so when this other one, when I find it, when that one is up, it's on, it's on some. It looks like a plant holder or something, a plant pot holder. When it's put on the ground, what happens? It rolls around all day by this itself. One, this right here, it rolls around mm -hmm. all day. And what about um, any readings off of it on the outside? Yeah, it makes gamma rays. It's uh, gamma rays? Mm -hmm. uh, dangerous? Is that no, dangerous? But it's much higher than background radiation. Okay. Um, any, any other type of readings? Um, this, well, it might be microwaves coming from it, but we, we need to do more testing on this one. And that's what we're setting up soon. All right. Yeah, I'd, would, be I'd be surprised if it's not giving up microwaves and RF at some level. It probably right. is. Yeah. Something like this, uh, you would expect um, if it flew at one time, it would fly again. The thing just sits there on that stand? Uh, well, the thing is, is that um, the, this one is not damaged. It appears it's just not online. So technically, with the right signal, it could, it could come back online. Okay. Um, maybe the maybe the aliens are just allowing them to possess it uh, for for a while for some reason, best known to themselves. And that's what uh, I would think. So, Steve, you you pretty much think that whatever this is 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 aliens. Most likely, yeah. And uh, what are your thoughts as well, uh, Patrick? Oh, it's completely yeah, completely. The, tech, the 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 abilities that the ones that happen in the buildings are is uh, amazing. They can perform a thing called quantum tunneling, which was witnessed during World War II. So what will happen is is that because the, the air crews saw the bigger variants of these during World War II, uh, and they used to f appear outside the aircraft and then fly inside the aircraft and then fly they around. Go right through, they go right through walls very easily. Yeah, they can go right through walls. It's called quantum tunneling, and that's what they could perform. Uh, and that's uh, we can only do that in the, on a small scale in 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 the lab, um, mm -hmm. but these things can have perfected it, uh, and they can they as I said they operate in buildings they can pass through pretty much anything they want. Now, yeah, I, John Hutchison and John John Hutchison and a lot of his experiments have seen the effect, um, and uh, I would imagine the government's uh, uh, seen it extensively in their labs. 
but okay, they perfected well, the technology. I, I got, uh, aliens, that is. A lot of times I've seen like light orbs or people talk about light orbs, but uh, I'm hearing you talk quite a bit about the silver metallic type. Um, how often are mm -hmm. people, I, I, I don't know myself, I guess I'm asking the question, is how often are people, do people seem to be talking about these? So the light is a byproduct of the propulsion system. So what you have is a high energy, uh, high energy passing over the shell, which is uh, interacting with our gas environment, uh, basically creating photons. It stimulates the gas molecules creating photons, which is light, which is the same process of that of lightning. So the depending on how high the how high the drive is energized, it can either look metallic or it can glow red or um, yeah. orange or yellow or white. Depending on depending on the frequency and the gases it's passing through at the time. It will look different colors, but they're all atomic colors. And so are you saying like a, I've heard people suggest that a certain vibration things can possibly go through walls, things like that. So is that oh, yeah. kind of along the same line as what, you, what you're talking about? Like it's a frequency then, vibration. Uh, no, I think it's tunneling is a very particular process. It's... it's uh, I don't think it's anything to do with vibrations. It's a very particular atomic process. I'm not uh, sure the details of how to do it, but it's probably a combination of uh, very high um, electric fields and uh, certain frequencies as well that cause it to do that. Um, the The atoms, I think, are being moved aside slightly in force space, and it renders the uh, the material um, uh, kind of uh, porous or like a viscous liquid in our, in our dimension so that the object can pass through it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, so it, th the, the thing I guess that I'm, uh, well interested in the most is that there's some type of object that's in someone's hands. I, I can't get that out of my head as we're doing this, uh, talk that, um, and that it was, can you describe how that was found at least and, and how this person obtained that and why did he, did he see this thing flying and somehow it crashed or what, what happened? So the story is, is that um, many years ago, um, a, a farmer saw a, uh, a UFO fly, hovering over his uh, property and it scared the family so much they locked themselves in the, in the house for two days. And when they came out, <clears throat> when they came out, all these silver seers were all over the property. I think it was like a dozen of them. Mm. So one, the farmer gave one of these spheres to the guy I know, uh, and I think he sold the other ones to the military. So that's what happened. And basically, it's been left in his shed for the last 30 odd years. He's, I, is this speculation that he sold them to the military, or did he say that he sold them to the military? No, it's, it's, a, it's a, probably a logical conclusion that he did, uh, because he came back in a, in a hurry trying to get the, the one that he gave away, uh, he wanted that one back. And so the only reason why he would do that is if he was offered a big price for it. Okay. Um, so we don't know where the other one, so there was 12 of them or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, this is all interesting. And I, uh, I guess I would have to ask you to, you know, please do follow up with me if anything happens along these lines, you know, with this thing being, uh, you know, tested and, and all yeah, that, okay. uh, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it would totally make the difference, uh, in basically in what everybody is, you know, the debates out there, whether we're being visit, visited or not in this, uh, if this was something that was actually off world and could be proven it was off world, then, you know, you would have, um, the most, significant find ever by the man you know the our species really i mean if you think about it well according according to what i can tell um the see the type ones only signal down to the type threes when there's intercepts occurring uh which but when you look at the actual patterns in the houses it means that they're coming online at least once or twice a week which means that the intercepts are occurring once or twice a week once or twice a week, mm -hmm. and 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 where exactly are you? All over the world. 
And uh, let me ask you this. I think of this a lot too. Well, why, why us? If there's intelligent life all through the, you know, the galaxy, through the universe, uh, why would it bother with us if life is everywhere? If that's well, there's a problem. There's a problem in genetics called synergy. Um, I don't know if you're aware of that. Are you? I'm sorry. Synergy. There's a yeah. problem in genetics yeah. called synergy. Mm -hmm. So basically, what that means is, is that what we're seeing currently in small isolated villages, uh, say like the villages up the mountains and so forth, uh, when they all start having uh, children together, the like their cousins will have children with the other cousins and so forth. What happens is a, is a thing called synergy, which basically means is that the, the genetics will get screwed up uh, and you'll have children that will die at the age of 10 years old. They just drop dead or they have lots of uh, mental or physical disabilities or problems. Uh, it's, it's like what happens when you when your sister has a baby with a brother. And then what happens is the, the genetic pool becomes so small, it starts causing lots of errors to the point where it implodes. So what happens is, is mathematically, uh, the, the problems that we're seeing in currently in small little villages um, will one day propagate out to towns and then cities and then countries, and then it'll be global. So the only way you can fix this problem is by going to another, finding another group that's compatible, and then you extract DNA from them to then insert into your own race, to then extend the lifespan of that race. That's how it works. So the only reason why the other groups are coming, the only reason why UFOs are coming is for genetic extraction. And that's it. Simple as that. So what do you think they they want to do? They're extracting, I don't understand exactly what you mean by that. They're extracting human DNA. They're incorporating certain uh, characteristics of our race into their own because they realize that by um, getting rid of uh, emotions uh, in their race a long time ago, they've limited themselves. There are certain uh, advantages to at least to some individuals in their um, in their hierarchy having uh, emotions and having uh, uh, reactions to things like humans have. Yeah, but um, in a nutshell, in a nutshell, it's a case of they need external DNA in order to extend the lifespan of their own race. And the same thing that, that, that might that might be it as well. But now they want they yeah, want certain human right. characteristics that they, they did not possess at this point. Yeah, maybe as well. but, uh, that is a fundamental reason. Uh, and the same thing will happen to us one day. And we'll have to go out there and do exactly the same thing. Uh, what do you think about uh, there are some theories that say Dr. Michael Masters thinks that UFOs could be time travelers. Would that somehow fit in the realm of things with your thoughts? Well, I don't know about that. I'm, all I know is is that uh, the seers, the type ones, and the, are basically intercepting uh, external groups and interests um, on a regular basis. Okay. Um, I know the aliens have time travel. It's part. It's possible that some of the aliens that we see are are time travelers, but um, I don't think most of them are. Myself. Um, uh, yeah. Well, another th another thought comes up a, a, a lot, and that is that whatever it is that everybody is seeing, uh, there could be uh, could be multiple theories, so multiple things happening, not just one particular thing. So, what have what's your thoughts on that, Patrick? In general, well, from an IT point of view, uh, from a logic point of view, I'm seeing the same patterns occurring again and again all around the world. Uh, the same uh, seers set up the same way. And they all point in the same direction and they all um, and even over skinwalker as well uh, in fact there's images of them being deployed from skinwalker and then in the distance you see a smoke trail of one when how they've intercepted them and, and brought them down um i i had what i'd consider a, a very uh strange like poltergeist situation happen um and i saw it all firsthand now um, I didn't see anything right in front of my eyes, but what I did was, uh, you know, I walked out into a hallway and a, a bedroom door, closet door slammed shut with all the windows down and the carpet mm -hmm. was, uh, it, you had to drag the door across the carpet. Um, so it was, it wasn't a door that would shut for any reason at all. You have to really force it to close. And yeah. then a broom uh, stood up. Um, I didn't see it happen, but the front door slammed and a broom that I had slid down the stairway earlier stood up against it and things like that were all happening. 
Um, was I that had, in the basement? That was not the basement. That was down in the, the front entryway. But I had right. three, three different things happen in a basket. Um, it adhered itself to a floor, a cement floor, and broke in half when I picked, went to pick it up, and it was freely sitting there. So mm -hmm. that, all these weird things happening. Um, so I guess I'm going to ask you how um, how would that work? You know so I mean? the Type 3 is a dynamic network, which means right. it can move around to its needs. So in some cases, well, generally it stays in the same areas, but it can also move around. So if it needs to be in an area which isn't covered, it will temporarily go into that into that building, uh, and then when it's in that building, it will do it will start emission it will start causing emissions, and then it will start causing diversions that hold you in place or put you in a certain area, while that's occurring. And in your case, it is probably operating in the attic, so it, it kept you uh, it kept you busy downstairs while it was broadcasting. So it's kind of like you think like it's keeping me away from an area or something like that is that it's an alignment with the inverse square law of radiation so basically the sphere itself is emitting radiation so it's keeping you at a distance which is keeping you safe so you actually think there was a a sphere somewhere in that in that property that's right yeah i never i never saw anything like that and um but i i do know one thing is that it really did happen and scared the heck out of me and, it happened recently in the gym as well um, there's a video on Twitter of it happening in a gym where uh, obviously the, the network had moved, gone into a gym, uh, and it actually dragged the guy out of the way. It dragged him away to the wall uh, and, he, and held him there for a few seconds while uh, the broadcast was occurring. And then once, once the broadcast is done, then it lets them go. Also, it's not unusual for you not to see anything uh, when UFOs are around. Uh, when they're right. seen, they usually, it's usually because they want to be seen. They can cloak in several different ways. They can control your mind if you just don't notice them. They can, they can physically cloak um, and um, they can appear as different objects like uh, aircraft if they want to. You see, um, visual stealth isn't hard. It's really not no. hard. It's no. just a redirect of photons. And you can control photons with gra a gravitational uh, wave. Or That's right. uh, if you can redirect gravity around the shell, you, you redirect light. So one could be literally in front of you and you won't see it. Well, I have heard the of people saying things like, you know, they'll they'll see it. It'll blink out, and then it then it shows up in another place instantly, and or it'll just blink out and it's gone. You know, not like they saw it shoot off. They just say they just saw it blink out. It's hard to say what's how, happening how, there. It could be teleporting, or it could be um, shooting off so fast that you just can't see it with your eyes. Um, uh, but um, there are several explanations for that. But also uh, with the spheres, what people see is uh, they'll be in a triangle and then they'll disappear and then they'll be in a, a different area. Now, what's happening there, you see, when it drops into like a stealth mode, it's redirecting the gravitational wave around it. Uh, as a result, it can't uh, send or receive signals. So what it does, it once it's in this uh, cloaked state, is is basically, although it's invisible, it can't send or receive signals. So it goes to where it needs to go, yeah. then it cloaks again. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Hmm. Well, um, well, this is all this is all really interesting. And, you know, but here's another thing, you know, you're talking about spheres, you did show like a disc with spheres around it. But can we always think that whatever type of objects people talk about these great big, huge triangles that people are seeing, they talk about all different types of shapes that they're seeing? Um, how would this Thing fit in? Are you just assuming that there has to be these little spheres around them? Well, that's what appears to be the case. In fact, most of the images that I see, if you uh, if you increase the contrast, you can see them, including in all the uh, U.S. Navy images as well. Do you actually see them in there? If you, yeah. But and are you the only one that are seeing these, or other other people? No, other people have seen them. Right? Everyone who everyone who, uh, who who looks can see them. I've seen a UFO launch uh, smaller spheres myself, so uh, it's a pretty common phenomenon, I'd say. Yeah, I mean, I have seen videos that look really interesting, where there's uh, spheres dropping out of, you know, like uh, you'll see like a light, and then spheres dropping down and stuff like that. It, it is pretty interesting. So uh, I'm not sure if that's, you know, where scientifically 
you, you, you seem like you have like the scientific thought on this, but I mean, is there any like paper for definitive uh, measuring of, of these things or anything like that? How do you mean measuring what? of what in particular? What? Uh, that these are around and, and their purpose for being there? You can tell by the behavior patterns. You see, in reverse engineering, you, you, what you do is you observe behavior patterns uh, and process. And what you observe, and as explained in my book, is uh, explains all the processes and behavior mm -hmm. patterns. And the same behavior patterns occur around the world. And they're seen all around the world almost every day. Hmm. Yeah, there, there's reason to believe they, they do a lot of things, including gather information and uh, do the paranormal activity, like Patrick is saying. But um, yeah, the aliens are pretty secretive. They're not gonna they're not gonna tell you what's going on. We just have to uh, infer what's going on from their behavior, as he says. And you see, this is why um, you might notice that there's a huge mental illness problem in the paranormal community, because or in the who do ghost hunting anyway. It's because they, they keep getting exposed to high energy emissions, which has a, neurolog a neurological effect. On well, the that and the aliens, are power, the aliens are powerful telepaths, and they can also mess with your mind if they want to. And I, think, spheres. I think that the constant ex exposure to these signals cause all sorts of mental problems. Hmm. Well, which is why people go crazy who live in these haunted houses. Huh, yeah. Yeah. Um, mm. I actually had, uh, unfortunately, had something come up during the show. And I'm going to, this is going to be an hour show this evening. So um, I would like for you to, if you would, give out the, uh, your website, how people can uh, reach you and your book one more time, if you would. Yeah, the book is called Quantum Paranormal, a 21st Century Analysis of the Paranormal Phenomena. It's free to read on Amazon Unlimited. Oh, um, oh, and it's actually nice. yeah. the only uh, paranormal book in the world that gets uh, technical specialist and military endorsements. Endorsement. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Patrick. Yeah, yeah. no worries. Thank you very much. All right. And thank you also, Stephen. All right. Thank you. All nice right. To be Take here. care. Yeah. You too. Bye. All right, everyone. So we'll be back next week. Sorry, I had to cut this short. Uh, I have an issue I got to take care of. Thank you so much. We'll be back uh, next week with Lee Spiegel. And remember to keep your eyes to the sky.